really cut out for me this morning. God, I've prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, and I've lost so much sleep. I've been, I've become acquainted like never before with the sufferings of your people in this last week. And you've made me weak as a result, and that's part of your plan, because where I'm weak, you're strong. And I, so I just pray, God, that you would weaken me even more starting now. I don't want to be present in this room. I want you to be present in this room. I don't want to be acknowledged in this room. I want you to be acknowledged in this room. Cause me and everyone in this room to decrease Jesus so that your presence and the love of you and the love for you will increase so that we will be a people that is not inward looking and self-centered, but that we would really be about your mission of love your unconditional, unwavering, steadfast love. Scripture says if we do not have love, we do not know God. And it's a scary thought to not know God. We want to know you. So reveal yourself through your scripture Please, and make us be the people of love that resembles your image. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Oasis. I love this church. If you've never been here before, what we do is we go through the Bible and we take our time. Uh, we go at God's pace and However far we make it in the scripture is however far we make it in the scripture. Uh, we're in the 15th chapter of John, which if you don't know the Bible very well, it's the fourth book in the uh, New Testament. You want to turn to it. This is our third week in John 15. We've been in the book of John since this church showed up in Athens, um, September 8th of 2013, I believe was our first week. And he's doing great things through his word in this church. So this is week three in John 15, like I said. And I've noticed that John 15 is really divided into three sections. The first section talks about our relationship with God and God's relationship with us. And the, the second section really talks about our relationship with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And then what we'll be going into this week is our relationship with the world, meaning the unbelieving world. Two weeks ago, when Chris preached about our relationship with God, it can really be summed up in this verse, John 15, 9. Just as the Father has loved me, this is Jesus talking, just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Abide in my love. And last week, the passage was John 15, 12 through 17, and the first and last verse are pretty much identical, kind of the cornerstone and capstone of that section of scripture and this is what it says in John 15 12 this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you abide in my love you and me child abide in my love my children love one another comforting refreshing words of hope and joy and we move on to verse 18. If the world hates you, it takes a turn. If the world hates you, our relationship with the unbelieving world, his first words to us, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. Just as a reminder, this conversation right here is happening between Jesus and the disciples 
after uh, Judas Iscariot had left to go get his money to come back and betray Jesus with a kiss this very night. This is where we're at in the ministry of Jesus. This very night, he's going to be betrayed. And he says, abide in my love, love one another. If the world hates you, remember they hated me first. We're going to tackle three questions, Lord willing, this morning. God, give me the mercy to do this. We're going to look at three questions. One is, what is Christian persecution? Two, not yet, Eli. Why is the church persecuted? And we're going to look at the reason, the reasons why the church is persecuted and we're going to look at the purpose behind which the church is persecuted as we ask why is the church persecuted so what is christian persecution why is the church persecuted and lastly what should our response be and what's interesting is as this chapter is broken it up into these three sections as life and love pertains to god pertains to the church and pertains to the world the way that the Lord revealed himself to me literally I don't know two nights ago I mean I saw this word sought the Lord for this word with many tears and sleepless nights and it just came the other night where I was able to sigh what he showed me is that we can find the answers to these questions in this passage just like the chapter is divided up as these questions pertain to God as these questions pertain to the church and as they pertain to the unbelieving world so let's read the passage John 15 18 through 16 4 he says if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sin. But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. But they have done this in order that the word may be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. When the helper comes whom I will send to you from the father, that is the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will bear witness of me and you will bear witness me of me also because you have been with me from the beginning. These things I have spoken to you that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. And these things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. Amen. What is Christian persecution? Up on the screen, there's going to be a map. This map was put out on January 7th, 2015. That's like a week and a half ago or something like that. 
uh, by Open Doors, which is a ministry to the church, in particular the church in areas that God's people are being heavily persecuted or even lightly persecuted. And on this map, all those colored countries are the what is known to be the fit the the 50 countries that where it is hardest most difficult most dangerous to be a follower of Jesus this year for the first time on the list is our neighbor Mexico pops in at number 38 interestingly enough the primary um, faith practice religion in Mexico is Christianity it's an interesting fact about that map that kind of brings it a little bit closer to home so this map is up there to tell you when I ask you what is persecution the first thing is it's real in this area in these countries the darker red is where the persecution is the most severe down to the the brown and the orange it's kind of hard to distinguish or green and and the blue is where it's less severe never severe le nevertheless it is real over a hundred million of your brothers and sisters are being persecuted whether it's by oppression like you can't have a Bible or else you'll go to jail or whether it is through torture that I would never even begin to go into because I would, might make you throw up and sometimes even death persecution is real persecution of God's people is real and it has always been the case and it is more rampant now than ever before in the history of the world we're just kind of insulated from it here in this place where we where we live before I go into more um, detail about what persecution is I feel that it's important that I throw out some things to help correct some wrong perspectives that we have four things mainly one is that persecution it's not a political battle it's a spiritual battle at the root of Christian persecution it is not a political battle I'm not saying it doesn't touch politics I'm not saying it doesn't run through this whole entire stream of politics but at its root it is not a political battle it's a spiritual battle and what this means is that no matter how we vote we cannot elect our persecution away so don't even try to accomplish that you will be persecuted it says our hope is not in any earthly king, any earthly governor or president or kingdom. Our hope is in our heavenly king. Our hope must be in the king of glory, Jesus, or else there is no abiding hope. If your hope is not in Jesus, but in something of this world or someone or some establishment of this world, then you will find yourself without hope and without the ability to endure whatever it is that will come to us that is called persecution. We're called not to be strong at the governmental level we're called to be strong at the spiritual level. We're called to be strong in Christ. Ephesians 6, 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Listen, this is not a political battle. This is a, a spiritual battle. It says in Ephesians 6, 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. It is not a political battle. Brothers, sisters, it's a spiritual battle. And it is very real. Number two, trying to help fix some of our wrong perspectives. And this is really a big one. As we are bombarded by media of all sorts, 
and all persuasions all the time, everywhere, I must say that the mainstream media that we are exposed to day in and day out is not the source of truth. I'm not saying that there's no truth in whatever whoever reports. What I'm saying is that it's not the source of absolute, pure, undeniable truth that you can bet your life on. Every avenue, every network, every program within the mainstream media sources has a political agenda. And you know this because they're always focusing on what the government is or isn't doing, which doesn't do anything but put fear in us. The source of truth is the Bible. It's always been the source of truth. It will always be the source of truth. And you can bet your life on what is in this book. I've tested it, and it's been proving true for 17 and a half years in this sinner's life. And I'm one of millions that can testify of that. This is true, not your mainstream media. I don't care whether it leans to the right or leans to the left. Jesus is not red. Jesus is not blue. Jesus is not green or any color. Jesus is God and God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. And there is darkness in every stream of the media. Turn to your Bible if you want to know what's true. You will find perfect love that will cast away all fear. You will find Revelation 2, 10, talking about a persecution, persecuted church. It says, do not fear what you are about to suffer. You will turn to Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12. It says, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against me, against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You're not going to find that on TV. But you find it all over this book. Dig in. Become a scholar. Become a student of this truth. Also, let it be known that there's only one church. That church is the persecuted church. There's not two churches. We hear this term, the persecuted church, and I understand they're talking about the people that live in those areas on that map. That's what they're talking about. I understand, but let it be known that there's not the persecuted church and then the unpersecuted church that lives in those areas that are not colored on the map. There's only one church. I get this from a scripture like Hebrews 10 that says, verse 32 but remember the former days when after being enlightened you endured a great conflict of sufferings check this out partly saying you endured suffering partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations and partly check this out by becoming sharers with those who were so treated you suffered either directly or indirectly because you shared in their sufferings. That's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. That's such a great love. When the scripture talks about the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 12, 26, it says, if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. So whatever's happening over here on this fingertip of the body is affecting this toe of the body over here one body one church that's the persecuted church we are a part of it we just have to embrace it whether we like it or not so the command in that regard is in hebrews 13 3 that says remember the prisoners as though in prison with them remember the prisoners as though in prison with them 
and those who are ill-treated, since you yourselves also are in the body. And I have to go here. And this is going to lead to some really interesting conversation for me later on, I know. I have to go here to correct our thinking. Muslims. Three things about the Muslims. One, not all Christian persecution is done by Muslims. It is true that in 40 of those 50 states, can you please put that map up, back up there? I, would, I want it to stay. We've got Bibles we can turn through. Thanks, buddy. It's true that in 40 of those 50 countries that the persecution is being done by people that uh, um, align themselves with uh, the Muslim faith. But you know, number one, for the last 13 years on that map, North Korea. You know what the primary religion there is? Atheism not Islam. The worst place to be a Christian in regards to how dangerous and deadly it is, North Korea. It's not where the Muslims are persecuting people. Okay? Not all the people that are persecuting and killing are Muslims. Secondly, not all Muslims persecute Christians. Did you know, and I learned this from a brother in Christ who was a Muslim for decades, just last week. Did you know that some entire sects within the Muslim religion are persecuted unto death by other Muslims? And because they understand that, they actually protect persecuted Christians so that other Muslims don't kill them. Entire sects. And we need to remember when it comes to this religious persecution, we need to go back some hundreds of years and remember our history. It's a shame. Our history, it's called the Crusades. For two, three hundred years, we were the jihadists. We were the ones killing people because of what they believed. Without mercy, without love. And you know what? It's happening today. I was going through headlines and I see headlines like Christians kill Muslim youths on way to youth football game and I almost cried it's happening today we have people in the name of Christ killing Muslims because they're Muslims the, you're the enemy I'm going to kill you as if our kingdom is on this earth shame we're not a militia we're missionaries And we need to be missionaries to the Muslims. And they are not the great enemy of the church. Satan is. Now, I'm not saying anything to defend Islam. I would never say anything to defend Islam. I have to put that on record. I have lots and lots of concerns for those who are in that religion. There's no life in Islam. I'm not saying anything good about it. I'm just saying... They're not our great enemy. Satan is. You know what's worse for us? You know what's more dangerous for your soul and my soul and the strength of this nation is a life of continual comfort and convenience because it makes us very complacent. That's more dangerous than someone we would call a terrorist. You know what's more dangerous to Christianity? You know what is really hurting the church in this nation? False teachers. People who proclaim a false Christ. I'll call some of them out. Joel Osteen, false teacher. Joyce Myers, Rob Bell. There's lots of them. Benny Hinn, there's lots of them. You don't have to look far. They're all over the place. And they're really hurting the church, aren't they, Chris? They're so dangerous. They're the ones you need to look out for. They're the ones you need to protect your children from. Before my passion goes on and gets in the way of God's word, what is Christian persecution? John 15, 18. If the world hates you, you know it's hated me before it hated you. Ultimately, as it relates to God, Christian persecution is the world's hatred, and I use it as a verb, hatred, the world's hatred of God. 
If it hated you, remember that it hated me first. The hatred of the world towards us is not rooted in their hatred of us. It's rooted in their hatred of God. So as it relates to God, Christian persecution is the world's hatred of God. You can take us out of the picture completely and persecution would remain because God lives. As it pertains to the church, yeah, it's the world's hatred of God's people. That's what persecution is. The world's hatred of God's people. Look at John 15, 19. The very last words of it says, the world hates you. The world hates you. Can't get around it. The world hates us. Why? Because it hates God. God is in us. Wherever we go, God goes. Our message is God's message. God lives in us. We live and proclaim His glory through word and deed in the world. Therefore, the world can't escape God in us. And they hate God and they want to kill God. So they want to kill us. What is persecution as it pertains to the world? Ultimately, it's a rejection, the world's rejection of true love. But wait, wait a second. Are you saying the world doesn't have true love? Sure. I mean, I know a lot of good people out there doing a lot of good things. There's a lot of organizations doing a lot more good works in this world than a lot of churches are. I mean, they set some pretty good examples. Are you sure they don't have true love? Yes. Yes. They don't have true love. I mean, when I say true love, I mean God's love. But wait, doesn't the scripture say here that they have love? In John 15, 19, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. And here's where I encourage you to become students of the word. With words like love and the world and other, lots of other words, um, you have to know that it doesn't always mean the same thing. And one of the reasons for that is because we read in English, the original Bible was written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, and the English is very limited, so we're not able to be as expressive as those languages, and so we have one word where they might have seven or ten or twelve. And so where it says here, if you were of the world, the world would love its own, when it talks about the love that the world has, it's talking about this Greek word phileo, which means to be friendly to one. Now, anyone can be friendly to one. I can be friendly to a police officer because I want him to lower the, uh, my consequence, you know, for whatever stupid thing I did. I can be friendly to a teacher because I want a good grade, but that doesn't mean I really have love in my heart for either one of those people. That's the kind of love that the world has, where it's, con it's external, it's conditional, it's self-seeking, it's not true love, it doesn't require a soft heart or anything of the heart. Anyone can accomplish this. When I say the world rejects true love, what I mean is, like I read earlier in John 15, 9 and 15, 12, where it says, just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. That kind of love is called agape love, which is unconditional love. It's steadfast love. It's a completely devoted love. It is an unwavering love. It is a committed love without Prejudice, that's true love. That's word, that, that's love that, that comes from the word of God being implanted in our hearts and making us alive and able to love God, love one another, and love even our enemy. The world doesn't have that. And it's not that they don't have agape love at all. And honestly, I'm just learning the Bible, guys, okay? I'm just learning. I just learned something this week. The world does have agape love. It's in the scripture. I was surprised to find this. The world has agape love. But see, their agape, their unconditional 
committed love is totally misplaced. It's not placed on God whom we are to, to have our roots in, whom we are to love above all things and all beings. beings. Their love is rooted in darkness. It says in John 3, 19, this is the judgment that the light is come into the world and men loved, and this is agape love, the, the men loved the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. So they've got agape just totally misplaced. They love the darkness rather than God who is light in whom there is no darkness. So what is Christian persecution? The world's hatred of God, world's hatred of God's people because God is in us and the world's rejection of true love. Why are we persecuted? Why are we persecuted? Well, easy. Persecution exists as it relates to God and it's right there again in John 15, 18. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. The world hates God. You know what that Greek word there for hate is? Hate. <laughs> hate. Whatever comes to your mind when you think of hate, active hate, continual hate. That's why God's persecuted. Because that is, and I've been there. We've all been there. Where we had that hate in our heart towards God. You might not remember it because you were too young or whatever. But we've all been there. Hatred towards God. That's why God is persecuted. Simply because we hate him. Not we hate him. I looked at the word we when I said we. Simply because the world hates him. We love God by his grace. Thank you, Lord, for correcting me. Why are we persecuted? What's the reason that the church is persecuted, John 15, 19. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because, and here's the why, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore, the world hates you. What's the reason? It's right after the because. You're not of the world. I chose you out of the world. I, you were in this earthly kingdom of sin, and I chose you and adopted you as my son, my daughter. You are connected to me. I am the vine. You are the branches. There's nothing you can do about it because I chose that it would be the reality. We're persecuted. The reason we're persecuted is that simple because God loved us so much to join us to himself. You don't have to Go deep in finding the reason why we're persecuted. Just as our comforts are rooted in Christ, just as our joys are rooted in Christ, so our suffering and our persecution is rooted in Christ. We live because God gave us life, because we're rooted in God. We're put to death by those who hate us because we're rooted in Christ. That's really hopeful. The world, as it pertains to the world, why are we persecuted? Look at verse 21. All these things they will do to you for my name's sake. All these things they will do to you for my name's sake. Because, here comes the why, they do not know the one who sent me. The reason, the foundational reason why these people are killing God's people is because they don't know God. That's the foundational reason. It's not because they do know something else. It's because they don't know God. What that should breed in our hearts is compassion, even tears, even sleepless nights, pain. Our, that should make us suffer. That should make us uncomfortable. There are people that don't no, God. Do you remember what it was like to not know God? I remember what it was like. It was terrible. 
That's a ridiculous word to use, terrible. I can't describe it. Remember, you can't describe. Do you remember what it's like to not know God? These people don't know God. Doesn't it make you want to love them? That's what it does to me. It makes me want to love them. I don't care if they kill me. I don't fear them. All they can do is kill my body. I fear God. Don't fear them. All they can do is kill you. They can't kill God in you. If you die, your testimony of Christ goes on forever because you are within the great cloud of witnesses that proclaims his glory throughout all creation right before the throne forever and ever and ever. They can kill you, but they cannot kill God in you. Love these people. Doesn't matter the cost. It doesn't matter. We're ready to die. If you're in Christ, you, your sins are forgiven. He has paid for them on the cross. He took your sin on his body, nailed to the cross. He said, it is finished. He said to his father, to us who killed him, Father, forgive them. And Jesus' prayers are always according to the will of God. We were forgiven. He prayed for us on the cross. We're forgiven. We're ready to die. I don't care if you haven't gotten your college degree yet. I don't care if you haven't gotten married yet, had children yet, whatever. If you're in Christ, there's nothing better than for you to go to Christ. That these people don't know God and they're not ready. Let's not even think about taking up arms against them. Let's not even think about that. They're not ready to die. Don't even think about preparing to defend yourself against them. Think about preparing to die for them, for the glory of God. That's how I want you, how God wants you to prepare yourself. Just as he died for us, even while we were helpless, even while we were his enemies, he died for us. Even while those people are our enemies, whoever they are, we are to die for them. We are not to defend ourselves against them. We really need to check our hearts because our hearts can deceive us and our desires and passions can lead us astray. Love, 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 love. Why are we persecuted? The purpose of persecution as it relates to God. The purpose. Not the reason, but the purpose. I love, I love how there's purpose in everything. You get to see it in God's word all over. What's the purpose? What's the purpose? Why? What do you have going on in your mind, God, that we don't know here in this persecution? Well, as it pertains to God, and I just love this. Look at verse 25 of John 15. They have done this simply for this reason. In order that the word may be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. That's why, simply so that God's word would be fulfilled. God's all about fulfilling his word. All about it. He says in Matthew 15, 18, and these aren't the exact words, I don't really feel like reading the exact words, but in paraphrase, he says that heaven and earth aren't going to pass away until all of his word's fulfilled. You can find that in different words, Matthew 15, 18. God is all about fulfilling his word. That's, that's the purpose, so that his word will be fulfilled. What's the purpose of persecution as it relates to the church? Look at 1526 in John. I love this. When the helper, that's the Holy Spirit, when the helper comes whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness of me. This is all about God's witness. It's all about God's witness. He will bear witness of me. As it pertains to the church, it's all about God bearing witness. You know, we have these times in our suffering and sometimes our suffering, especially here in America, our suffering pretty much doesn't look like persecution. You know, we get whiny sometimes. Like, oh, I said I was a Christian. It's not a persecution. That's stupid. But we have, we do suffer in other ways and it's real and there's sickness and all these things, loneliness and all kinds of things that we suffer from. And, um, we come to the end of ourselves. But that's where we find God bearing witness. That's where we find the Holy Spirit bearing witness. 
And I, I loved it. When we were singing, um, your grace is enough, your grace is enough, you know, it's right here. I love it. It's right here in um, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And this is right after Paul is talking about certain suffering that he's going through. He says, and he has said to me, my grace is sufficient. <laughs> my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is perfected in weakness. My grace is sufficient, for my power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecution, content with persecution, yes, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, when I am weak, then I become strong. Why? Because God bears witness. When we don't have the ability to endure, God endures in us and through us on our behalf. That's the purpose. So that the witness of God being alive in us would just shine. What's the purpose of God's persecution as it pertains to the world? Let's go back to John 15, verse 27. So he will bear witness of me and, verse 27, and you, church, you will bear witness also because you have been with me from the beginning. This is all, this persecution is all about witness. It's all about the name of Jesus being magnified in and through his people to one another and to the world. You will bear witness. I, these are hopeful words. You will. It doesn't matter whatever kind of persecution it is, you will bear witness. And of course, it's not us and our strength, it's God bearing witness outward through us. You will bear witness. And remember, it says back in verse 21, these people don't know God. We must bear witness. They need him. Like I said, we're ready to die. They're not. And it says in verse 20 that some, some persecute us just like they persecuted Jesus. But just like some kept Jesus' word, some of those people will keep our word also. That's hopeful. As we bear witness in this world, whatever the cost, there are going to be some people, maybe one out of 10,000, but there's going to be some people who believe and find God. That's awesome, and it makes it all worth it, doesn't it? Seriously, doesn't it? Would, just think, if you were to live your entire life, and at the end of your life, you had the knowledge that through your life, one person came to know God through your faithfulness to him, your love for him, and your love for one another, and your love for your enemy, wouldn't it make life worth it, regardless of the suffering? But for me... Last question, and this one's going to be real quick because the answer is so simple. What should our response be? What should our response be? John 15, 9. This is going to be the third time I've read this, I think. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Our response to persecution as it pertains to God is to abide in his love. It doesn't say abide in my love when things are going well and then something else when things aren't going well. It says abide in my love, period. Good times, bad times. Abide in my love. It's our only option with God, to love God. He doesn't say, love me or else. What about as it pertains to the church? I've read this one earlier too in John 15, 12. This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. How did he live, love us? He laid down his life for us. He didn't regard himself as more important than us. It tells us in Philippians, I think, 3, 
maybe four, that we are not to regard ourselves as more important than others, but others is more important than ourselves. Love one another. That's our only option. He never says, love one another or, no, there's no or, love one another. I don't care what life looks like. I don't care if you think you're going to die if you love your brother. Love one another. It's our only option. It's simple. Our response to God should be love. Our response to one another should be love. Our response to the world. And I'm going to go to Matthew 5 for this. Verse 43. Jesus talking. I love it when Jesus talks, by the way. Jesus. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I, remember, this is the word made flesh. This is God talking. Okay, this is God talking. We must listen. This is Jesus talking. Jesus is the son of God. He's God made flesh. Let's listen. Let's listen. Let's really zero in on his words. I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And I have a plethora of scriptures that I'm not going to go into to help you apply that. You can come ask me for those scriptures anytime. I don't have time to go into that. It's a whole nother sermon, loving your enemies. But he says, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you in order that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. What should our response be to the world, even if they are persecuting us unto death, even? Torture, which is happening all over. Love. Do you know that thousands of people, if today is like yesterday and the day before and the day before and the day before, thousands and thousands and thousands of people in those countries today are going to come to know God. You know how? Love. Love. God's people are out there loving them while they're trying to kill them. It's our only option. Someone asked me some days ago, Smiles, what's your New Year's resolution? I said, you know, I really thought about it and the only thing kept coming to mind, I just want to, I just want to be more loving. It's really it. That's my New Year's resolution. I want to be more loving. I think that's a good one, since that's my only option. <laughs> You've heard that, huh? I raised my kids that way. What? I said way more, than more than once. Eli, my son, says more than once I've heard that. That's how I raise my kids. If they're being unloving, I say, I say two words. I say, one option. They know. That boils down to one word, love. <laughs> they know. If I say one option, they know that means love. I don't give my kids another option. That's how I raise my kids. Why? Because that's what, it's, that's what the option God gives us. Why should I give my kids another option? If I'm to raise them rooted in the love of God, why should I give them another option? Not love your brother or go to your separate rooms. Not love your brother or don't talk to each other. No, love your brother. There's no or. In my home, there's no or. I need to preach it to myself more often, don't I? The last scripture I'm going to go to is in Luke 6. Jesus talks again. The Word of God talks. Luke 6, 27. He says this. But I say to you who hear, pause. Here's my encouragement to you. Here, here. Stop. Quiet everything out. Silence everything out. I don't care if you're hungry, want to go to lunch. Whatever. Stop, stop. Just hear. I say to you who hear, hear this. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. And whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And whoever takes away what is yours, 
even if it's your own home, even if it's your own children, even if it's your wife, even if it's your husband, even if it's your health, whatever. Whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. And just as you want people to treat you, treat them in the same way. And if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. That's the phileo we are talking about earlier. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. And though we have sin, folks, we're not sinners. We're saints. If you're in Christ, you're washed of your sin. You're a saint. Not because of anything you've done, but because God has called you his child, his holy saint. We're not to be like the sinners. We're to love like the saints. You can say, I, 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 I know me too well, smiles. I know me too well. I can't do that. I can't. I know I can't do that. You know what? I can't either. I know me better than you know me. I can't do it. But if you are in Christ, the helper, the Holy Spirit, God himself is in you. And you know what? I know him. And regardless of what we know about ourselves or one another, one thing we can know about our God, our God in us, he can do it. He has done it, and he's doing it, and he will do it. Ryan, you want to come up and pray for us as we get ready to take communion? The members of the church give to the offering. As Ryan's coming up, I want to encourage you. As we look ahead to things like the world hates you, they will make you outcast from the synagogue. They will persecute you. As we look ahead to that, having no idea what the details of that really looks like, let's not make assumptions. As we look ahead to that, let's look back at two examples that the Lord has given us and two of our brothers. And I want to tell you their story, and I'm just going to read them. These are words of ancient historians. These people right now are in the great cloud of witnesses, as Hebrews 12 calls it. And these people are cheering us on, saying, go, 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 endure, fight the good fight, finish the race, love, love, go. God is in you. God is your strength. God is your all in all. You are weak, but he is strong. You die. He lives in you. Go! These people are cheering us on. Andrew, the apostle, this is a phenomenal story. I think the word, the name is Aegidas. Aegidas, who was the governor of Patras, Greece, became enraged at Andrew for his preaching and ordered him to stand before the tribunal, which is a court of justice in his attempt to do away with the Christian faith. When Andrew resisted the tribunal by refusing to renounce Christ, the governor ordered that he was to be crucified. While en route to the place of his execution and seeing the cross waiting for him, he never changed his expression, nor did he stumble in his words. With his bold faith, he maintained and he said, O oh cross, these are the words of Andrew the Apostle, O oh cross, most welcome and longed for, with a willing mind, joyously and desirously I come to you, being the scholar of him, him whom did hang on you, him which did hang on you. Because, cross, I have always been your lover, and I yearn to embrace you. Andrew was tied to his cross with thick, tight ropes for three whole days, suffering dreadful pain. 
but continuing constantly to tell the people around him of the love of Jesus Christ. The people, as they listened to him, began to believe his words. And they asked the governor to let him be taken down from the cross. And not liking to refuse them, he at last ordered the ropes to be cut. But when the last rope was severed, the body of the apostle fell to the ground quite dead. His last words spoken on the cross were, Accept me, O Jesus Christ, whom I saw, whom I love, and in whom I am. Accept my spirit and peace in your eternal realm. He says, go. He sees Jesus with his own eyes right now. He sees what we can't see. Let's embrace what he sees by faith. James, the apostle. By the way, this James, his story, this is the brother of John who wrote the gospel account that we're going through right now. James, John's brother. In Acts 12, 1 through 3, it records that James was beheaded with a sword by order of Herod Agrippa I. Historians record that this was done in order to please the Jewish leaders who had become furious because of the rapid spread of the gospel and growth of the church. It's recorded that James's accuser, observing the great courage and constancy of mind wherewith the apostle underwent his trial, was so affected with it that he, the accuser, repented of what he had done. And he declared himself publicly to be a Christian. And having been granted his own request, he was condemned to be beheaded with James. As they were both led together to the execution, he begged for the apostles' forgiveness for having apprehended him for his faith. And after pausing for a moment, James turned to his accuser, check this out, and he embraced him, and he said, peace be with you, brother. He then kissed him, and they were both beheaded together. God was pleased that his name be glorified by so illustrious a testimony. Try to save your life for Jesus. Seek how you can lose your life for Jesus. The world hates God. The world hates you. The world needs to see God's agape love, which you have to give to the world. What will your testimony be when persecution comes to you? May it be a testimony.